In Algebra 2, we studied complex numbers. Complex numbers introduced us to the concept of the imaginary number, which was a set of numbers that we could use to express solutions to problems when the real number system was not allowing us to do so. The word imaginary is a bad word to describe this because it does not mean they don't exist. They do. They just didn't fall under our real number system. Most complex numbers are written in the form a plus bi, where a is called the real part or the real component, and b is the imaginary part or the imaginary component. We know it's the imaginary part because it has the lie. By definition, we said that the square root of negative 1 was the imaginary unit, i. And if you square both sides, we found out that i squared was the real number, negative 1. So in our first example, in the complex number 3 plus 4i, which part is the real part and which part is the imaginary part? Well, the real part is always the part without the i and the imaginary part is the part that has the i. Remember that it doesn't matter in what order this is written in. For example, if I were to give you negative two-thirds i plus one-half, then this would be the imaginary part, the negative two-thirds, and the real part is one-half. If I were to give you six i, I want you to remember that's the same thing as 0 plus 6i. So 0 is the real part, 6i is the imaginary part. Or any real number is really a complex number. It's just that the imaginary part is 0. 6i has a special name. It's called a pure imaginary number. And that happens when you have a complex number with zero as its real component. We found out that there is a way to work with complex numbers on your graphing calculator. i is the second function above the period. So if you wanted to evaluate any of these particular problems in your calculator, you could type them in verbatim, hit enter, and the right answer would spit out. However, for parts a and b, it's probably easier to just do them in your head because adding and subtracting complex numbers is the same as adding and subtracting like terms. You would add the real parts and then you would add the imaginary parts. For subtraction, you would subtract the real parts, 3 minus 4 is negative 1, and you would subtract the imaginary parts. 5i minus negative 2i is positive 7i. Or remember, you can always go do this, if that makes it easier. Multiplication is where you may want to utilize your graphing calculator a little more. However, multiplying it is just using FOIL. First, outside, inside, last. The middle terms are like terms. What happens at the end? We defined i squared as negative 1. That means the last term becomes positive 10, and it's a real number because it's really negative 10 times negative 1. Negative 6i plus 20i is going to give you 14i. And then you can just add these real components, and you get 22 plus 14i. I claim to you, you will get the exact same answer if you were to have done it in the calculator. It's the next problem that really needed its own separate page because I need to establish a pattern. If you do i raised to the first power in your calculator, it'll tell you the answer is i because anything to the first power doesn't change anyway. We had already established that i squared is negative 1. But if you do i to the third in your calculator, you get negative i. The reason that happens is because i to the third is i squared times i, so that's negative 1 times i, which is negative i. And then i to the fourth 
is 1. The reason that happens, I'm going to erase this, is because i to the fourth, you could rewrite it as i squared times i squared, which is negative 1 times negative 1, which is positive 1. Or you could have written it as i to the third times i, and we already know that i to the third is negative i, and negative i times i is negative i squared, but that's negative times negative 1, which is positive 1. So there are several ways you could look at that problem, but the calculator will tell you the right answer. Now the thing is that if you try to put i to the 23rd in your calculator, it'll give you garbledygook. It gives you some weird looking answer. I claim to you that every power of i is either i, negative 1, negative i, or 1. The reason this happens, any, we're going to focus on the i to the 4th. Any exponent that's divisible by 4 is always going to be 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the closest number to 23 that's divisible by 4, which is 20. And then there are 3 more i's. Well, i to the 20th is going to be 1 because any power divisible by 4 is going to be 1. And 1 times i to the 3rd is negative i. I know this from my little chart. So even though the calculator won't evaluate i to the 23rd for me, I can still figure out what i to the 23rd is. In order to address complex number division, I first need to introduce to you something called the complex conjugate. When we first learned in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 how to get rid of radicals in the denominator of a fraction, we multiply by something called a conjugate. So if you add a plus the square root of b in the denominator of a fraction and you don't want radicals in the denominator, we rationalize the denominator by multiplying the fraction by a minus the square root of b. Imaginary numbers have something similar, so we call it a complex conjugate. The complex conjugate of a plus bi is a minus bi. In other words, the complex conjugate is the opposite of the imaginary part. Just the imaginary part and not the real part. So let's use the complex conjugate to simplify a complex division problem. We don't want i's in the denominator of fractions, so to get rid of three uh, or the 1 minus 2i in the denominator of this fraction, we're going to multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. This is one of those cases where using the calculator to multiply is going to be very useful. Now the reason for multiplying by the conjugate is because when you multiply conjugates together, the imaginary parts go away and you end up with a squared plus b squared, which is going to be a real number because there are no i's. That's why we're doing this. So if you use your calculator to multiply the numerators together, rather than doing FOIL, which will take you longer, you will get negative 7 plus 11i. Let's make that look like a negative. And the denominators, when you multiply them together, you'll get 1 squared plus 2 squared, which is 1 plus 4, which is 5. But the calculator will do the work for you. We traditionally write the answer as negative 7 over 5 plus 11 over 5i. Some graphing calculators will do this for you. Sometimes it won't. You can try out your particular graphing calculator to see if it works. If you put parentheses 3 plus 5i, close it. Divide by parentheses 1 minus 2i, close it. Hit enter, and it gives you a decimal answer. And then hit math enter, enter to turn it back into a fraction. It may actually tell you the answer is negative 7 over 5 plus 11 over 5i. And if it does, great for you. And if it doesn't, I'm sorry, some of the calculators for some strange reason won't do this work for us. And that includes newer calculators. All right, let's go look at another multiplication or division problem. I want to get rid of 4i in the denominator of this particular fraction. Well, the conjugate of 4i is negative 4i. Remember that conjugate means change the sign of the imaginary component. Again, 
I would just use my calculator at this point in time to multiply these together. The calculator should spit out to you negative 7 plus 11. Oops, let's make that look nicer. Negative 7. Nope, I'm looking at the wrong one. It should give you 12 minus 28i, sorry about that, over 16, which you'll need to reduce 12 over 16 minus 28 over 16i. You can reduce each of these fractions in your calculator separately. 12 over 16 is 3 fourths. 28 over 16 is 7 over 4. And here is the answer in A plus BI format. The square root of negative r, by definition, is going to be i, the square root of r. Now, we don't always have um, a number under the square root sign that we can simplify. Sometimes we have to go simplify it ourselves. So in this next example, remember we had said that the square root of negative 1 was i. That's because it's i square root of 1. Well, what's the square root of 1? It's 1. What's 1 times i? i. We're going to say the square root of negative 16 is 4i. You know it's going to have an i, and the square root of 16 is 4. But how about if I give you the square root of negative 3? You can't take the square root of 3. So we're going to leave the answer like this, i square root of 3. Don't forget, though, that if you have a number under a radical that can be simplified, you should simplify it. So if I give you, for example, the square root of negative 12, you have to simplify 12. Remember, it's 4 times 3, so it's going to be 2i, the square root of 3. And I expect that you remember how to simplify radicals from your Algebra 1 geometry and Algebra 2 experiences. Not all problems that end up with imaginary components can be done in the graphing calculator. That's because this particular problem, you, if you put in square roots in your calculator, you're going to get decimals. I don't want decimals in my answer. I want exact answers. So to attack this problem, I would start by simplifying all the radicals if I can. Square root of 12 is 2 to the square root of 3 minus the square root of negative 3 is i the square root of 3. The next parentheses is going to be 3 plus the square root of negative 4 is 2i. Now I'm going to FOIL. I get 6 the square root of 3 plus 4i, the square root of 3, not like terms, minus 3i, the square root of 3, minus 2i squared, the square root of 3. First of all, these are like terms because they have i's. The other ones don't have i's. So this is going to be 1i, the square root of 3. Remember over here, i squared is negative 1, so this becomes a plus 2 to the square root of 3. It becomes real. And then there was my 6 square root of 3 at the beginning. Now these are like terms. And I get 8 the square root of 3 plus i the square root of 3. There's my real and my imaginary components. The reason for reviewing complex numbers is because not all solutions to polynomials are going to give us real answers. Sometimes we're going to get complex solutions. And in order to find the complex solutions, we need to use the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula can only be used on a quadratic equation, but what we're going to do is we're going to use the graphing calculator to find any real solutions. We can use synthetic division to divide the real solutions out. And then we can use the quadratic formula to finish off any complex solutions. So a review of using the quadratic formula. Sometimes we don't use the quadratic formula. I'm going to claim to you that in this particular formula, I would not use the quadratic formula. The book uses the quadratic formula. I would just do this, which is subtract 9, square root both sides, and you would get x is equal to plus or minus 3i. The only time you're going to take a square root and write the plus or minus symbol in front is when you're solving an equation.
if you are just simplifying or evaluating. Those cases you will not use the plus or minus symbol, only when you are solving an equation. Now here's a case where I would use the quadratic formula. Now the reason that we have to use the quadratic formula is because if you graph this in your calculator, it does not cross the x-axis. Well, if it doesn't cross the x-axis, then how do you find the solutions? The quadratic formula. And it's going to find for me the complex solutions. So x equals the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. I always tell my students that the best way to evaluate this is in parts. So I would evaluate the first part, which is negative 4, plus or minus the square root of negative 4 all over 2. And then the square root of negative 4 is 2i. So you get negative 4 plus or minus 2i over 2, which reduces to negative 2 plus or minus i. So the two solutions are negative 2 plus i and negative 2 minus i. When you have a complex solution to a quadratic equation, then its complex conjugate must also be a solution. That's called the complex conjugate theorem, or it's also sometimes called the complex zero theorem. So if you noticed in this previous problem, one of the solutions was negative 2 plus i, its complex conjugate was also a solution. So we're going to do this one more time. I claim to you that 4x squared minus 24x plus 37, if you were to graph it in your calculator, it would not hit the x-axis. So let's use the quadratic formula. x equals the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And then I would do this in part, so I get positive 24 plus or minus the square root of negative 16 all over 2a, which is 8. Then the square root of negative 16 is going to be 4i. And when I break this up, 24 over 8 is 3, and 4 over 8 is 1 half. So the two solutions are 3 plus 1 half i and 3 minus 1 half i and they are complex conjugates. And this is going to push us into our study of section 3.6.